Okay, everybody, we're switching over to our paranormal part of the program, though it's not really paranormal tonight, per se. But as many of you know, that uh, we are very interested in, in some of the historical sites. So the author that we have with us tonight, you can see him on the screen, is Dave Dyer. Uh, we're going to get to Dave in just a minute. Now, Dave, we normally start off with a prayer even though we just ended one, but uh, we try to have the podcast split up when we uh, post them. So, uh, uh, Gerald, would you lead us in prayer, please, to start us? Yes. Heavenly Father, we ask that this podcast, Lord, is anointed and blessed, Lord, in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, now then, uh, I'm on a disaster relief operation, so I don't have the, the for the Red Cross tonight, and I don't have the materials that I normally have. I have Dave's book, and normally have it where I can put my hands on it. I've shown it to y'all in several of the videos that I've done when we've talked about this in meetings, the road to San Jacinto. Absolutely. So anyway, uh, Dave has spent a lot of time working on this book. It's a new approach. I, I like what I've seen in it. And I want to follow his book with our group and go out and visit some of these sites. And I, I want to give uh, his publishers some feedback. So first off, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dave Dyer. Dave, thank you for joining us tonight. If you would, tell us a little bit. You're muted. You want, want to turn your mic on? There we go. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Here okay, you loud good. sir. There's always right. a different button to push. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Well, I want to thank you for writing your book. Thank you for being a guest yeah. with us. And uh, if you would, uh, how about sharing with us uh, some of what motivated you to write this book and how you came up with this idea and uh, explain a little bit about it, what your book tells us. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, John and I met at the San Jacinto Monument. I was giving a talk out there uh, on uh, Houston's trip to San Jacinto. There's been an awful lot of work on the San Jacinto battle itself, but that was literally like an 18 minute event and everything was set by the time they got there. The, the thing that interests me, the 42 days leading up to San Jacinto, all of the trouble that Houston had to go through, all of the planning, all of the issues he had to deal with, all the decisions he had to make, the 42 days leading up to it are really a fertile ground for historical research. And they really haven't been researched as thoroughly as the battle itself. So I use this as a pandemic project for me. Uh, I need, like everybody else, I needed to get out of the house. And I said, well, I'm gonna go out to Gonzales where the army first formed. And I'd never been to Gonzales, even though I like history. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm going to see what's happening there. And I went to Gonzales. And then the next, I said, well, I wonder where they went after Gonzales. And I did a little research and I went to that spot. And then I said, well, where did they go next? And there were all in all, I, I think 20, uh, 31 spots, 31 separate campsites that Houston had over the 42 days. And less than half of them have historical markers. So people are losing contact with something that I think is a great historical resource, a great cultural resource to know what went on there, what, what was uh, the motivation of the people, how many people, what was happening throughout that trip. So I set out a plan where I would visit every site and what I would do to identify them, because if they weren't fully identified, I read the primary sources that were written by uh, soldiers who were there at the time, not the secondary sources. And by the way, if you look in the uh, uh, bibliography of the book, it's broken out into primary and secondary sources. Too often history is taught through secondary sources. People give you a big thick book to read and tell you to memorize some dates and names and then it's easy to test you about whether or not you're, you know, you got anything out of it. But the real interesting thing for me is to read the actual discussions of people who were eyewitnesses to these events. And Houston had a lot of soldiers who did exactly that. They wrote excellent commentaries on things that happened. 
So I read through those looking for location information because I was trying to identify places where he stayed, uh, places that were campsites. And all of them would require water, for example, because he had up to, at one point, 1,400 men with him and horses. They need water at every site. So that was one of the limiting factors. Does this site have water? And I would make for each site a list of uh, clues that I got from the uh, from the primary sources. We went six miles yesterday. We camped near a, a, a spring. We crossed this creek, and then we went another two miles. So I, I would make a list. This is my methodology. I'd make a list of uh, clues, and then look at maps to try to see if those clues made sense. Did did the distances add up? things like that. Uh, was there really a creek there? And finally, I, I looked at old maps, if possible, and tried to match those up too. And then, of course, I would visit every site and try to identify what's there now. Was any of that possibly stuff that was there when they, uh, when, when they were being chased by the Mexican army across the face of Texas. And that was for a 42 day trip that Houston had. And it was 42 days where his life was at risk every day. If a Mexican army had caught him, he would have been a dead man. And many of his soldiers, most of them probably would have been killed. And they were under complete stress all the time. So that was my, that was my methodology to identify every campsite. Some of them are on in public areas, parks, things like that, that you can go to easily, roadsides, some of them. And some of them are on private property where I didn't try to get entrance. Uh, I could photograph it maybe from the street, from the outside, but I didn't try to get a, an entrance uh, to all of these private uh, uh, residences that might have uh, some, uh, some, some campsite. And a lot of these people are some. One of them I actually do know because I'm involved with archaeology, and I did some archaeology at one of these sites. And they wanted to keep their site very secret because once somebody finds out about it, then it becomes uh, a target for relic hunters who will go in and just dig things up and look for things. So uh, there, there was a, a big concern of privacy. But anyway, I, I tried to identify every site. I think I did. And for your interest in the paranormal, uh, I think one of the things that, uh, that might make sense for you to look at are sites where very, very intense things happened, emotionally intense, and things that, uh, that would be memorable in, in, uh, to someone's mind, not sites uh, maybe of great strategic importance, but sites of great emotional importance. And uh, so I've got three, actually, that I'm going to recommend that you visit. And uh, let me just get the book out. By the way, the book, uh, The Road to San Jacinto, published by Texas A&M Press, and it's available from Texas A&M. It's also available uh, on Amazon and uh, just look at it under my name, uh, Dave Dyer, D-Y-E-R, and you will find it. And one of my models, by the way, speaking of other books, this is a book that I loved, and it was written by a British historian called Michael Wood, and he had a TV series out of it. Now, they're not gonna make a TV series out of my stuff because I'm not as charming uh, as he is, but he tracked Alexander the Great across Asia, and he tried to visit the exact places that Alexander the Great went. And I love this. And this was a TV series in the 90s, and I watched it religiously. And so a lot of my work in history is based on identifying individual spots, going to those spots, and understanding what happened right there. I used to write a, uh, uh, a magazine article. It was a monthly column. It was called Footprints. 
And every month I would pick something in Houston of historical importance and then go to that site and see what was there now, if anything. And sometimes there were things, sometimes there weren't. But it was it was all based on locations. So anyway, in the 42-day trip, uh, here are, I've got three chapters that I'm going to recommend that you might uh, have more interest in. John talked about possibly just going to every site, even on the same day that uh, uh, that Houston was there, and that would be terrific uh, if you could do that. In fact, I'd love to see that. But let me just tell you a, a couple of these that make sense. First of all, chapter 12, it's called Muddy Mill Creek. And I, I wasn't looking forward to doing this chapter because nothing happened there. I said, oh man, I'm gonna have a hard time finding anything to write about. And when I started reading the, uh, the journals of uh, one of the people who was there, it turns out that in the middle of the, they were only there one night, but in the middle of that night, one of the soldiers passed away. He had probably had cholera. It's not, uh, nobody ever, of course, correctly diagnosed him, but he probably had cholera. And this, one of the soldiers said he woke up in the morning to the sound of a grave being dug outside his tent. So uh, the soldier who passed away was buried uh, in an area in a grove of trees. And I, I went there and it looks like it's on private property. I'm not absolutely certain it's the same grove of trees, but I did photograph it, and uh, there are GPS coordinates for finding it. By the way, the, the again, the methodology for the whole book, this is designed as a self-guided field trip. So the way you use it, you read the book, read the chapter, and then you go to the QR codes at the end of each chapter, there will be a QR code, put your phone over it, it pops up Google Maps, and Google Maps gives you directions to that specific site. And then when you're there, there's another link you can click that will give you a podcast of me reading that chapter because nobody's gonna wanna carry a book around and read it while they're at a site. So you can hear it on your cell phone rather like uh, one of these tours at a museum where you're walking around and it, it gives you uh, the background on the art that you're looking at. And that's that's really my approach to Texas history. My, uh, my favorite line in the book actually is the very first line of the uh, introduction where I say that the Texas countryside is like an open air museum. And that's, that's the way I treat it. it there's history, hidden everywhere, and it's not curated for you, like in a real museum. So anyway, I would think you might look at chapter 12. I think that's uh, that's an interesting one that, uh, that could generate a lot of emotional activity. Also, chapter 14, it's called Basic Training on the Brazos. Uh, Houston found what he considered to be a safe place and stayed there for a couple of weeks. Uh, the soldiers were all volunteers. They were they very rarely had any military experience and he needed to train them and drill them and uh, in the mud. They were all living in deep mud at the time. Uh, and sure enough, a couple of them decided that they were gonna desert, that they were going to leave. And that was pretty common. So Houston decided he's gonna make an example of these two guys. And he ordered them to be shot. And one guy was a younger guy named Scales and the other guy was an older guy named Garner. Well, everybody liked this younger guy. He was a very personable, nice young kid. So very quickly, Houston relented and said, okay, we won't shoot Scales. He'll, we'll, we'll we'll treat him differently because he's so young. And <laughs> on the other hand, the older fellow, Garner, nobody liked him, he was kind of a villain. And so they said, we don't care if you shoot him. So they were, they prepared to shoot, first of all, they let Scales off 
Scales, by the way, at the first opportunity, ran off again and was never seen again. I tried to track him down in Texas history, but could never find anything about him. So he, he vanished for the second time. But Garner, they were getting ready to shoot him. They had dug a grave at this site in, in chapter 14, and uh, they were getting ready to shoot him when Houston sent an emissary with the notice to, okay, let him off. Don't, don't shoot him. You know, he, uh, Houston had decided uh, essentially that he needed a villain. Uh, he needed every man in his army that he could get. So uh, this guy was let off. And it turns out he went on to be uh, a very successful soldier at San Jacinto and contributed greatly uh, to, to the battle. So that would be a good sight, I think. Excuse me to look at uh, for some potential paranormal activity. And then finally, uh, chapter 25. Uh, I know it, many of you, I'm sure, know Texas history, and there's the famous story about Houston burning Vince's Bridge just before the battle started. And this was uh, supposedly <laughs> to prevent uh, retreat from any of his soldiers, but it was also more importantly to prevent uh, any reinforcements coming across that way on the Mexican side because there were other uh, reinforcing armies out there. Um, at that site, the, it's a good site to visit, first of all, because there is a historical marker. It's obvious where it is. And you can get to it easily and you can walk right up to the edge of the bayou as I did several times. And it's, uh, now why would it be interesting? One of the things that I found out in reading about it is that the Mexican army had a hard time crossing it, crossing the bridge when they were going to San Jacinto because the mule pulling their big cannon, the golden standard, the mule absolutely refused to go over that bridge. And they slapped it and beat it and did all of the things they could do to try to convince a mule to do something. Uh, and the mule refused to go. And so they actually had to send the mule and the cannon a couple of miles downstream to find a shallow place to ford where they didn't have to use uh, this bridge. So I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you know how animals might see things that we don't see, or you know how you ever take your dog out for a walk and, and you know he's seeing something or hearing something or smelling something that you don't see. So I don't know, but that mule had some sort of action on that bridge uh, that, uh, that I think if I were a paranormal investigator, I would at least want to think about that. Now the bridge itself, and this is very interesting. Uh, Death Smith, who was Houston's uh, main scout, went there with, uh, I think, four or five other guys to burn it down. And it wouldn't burn. It wouldn't burn because there had been a lot of rain. It was all wet. And I think it was supposed to be cypress wood as well. So he had an ax with him, and they chopped it down and dropped it in the bayou. So. There's some discussion historically about whether the bridge was cut down or burned down, and uh, you can go back and forth. But one day that I was there, going right up to the edge, I could. it was low tide at a time when it was very, very dry. And I could look into the bayou, and there were some heavy timbers that were there at the bottom that were normally just not visible, but they were they were under the water line a little bit, but you could see them. And I think those are possibly timbers left over from the original bridge that have been underwater since 1836. One of the things I like to do at all of these sites was to look for anything that was uh, potentially a leftover, anything that was there 
when Houston was there, any physical object. There is one that, that I, you might want to go to. I was, wasn't one of these three sites, but there's a there's an oak tree in Columbus, uh, and Houston camped uh, in Columbus for a couple of weeks. Uh, there's an oak tree that's called the Columbus Oak, and it's supposed to be 500 years old. And it was right in between where the Mexican army was camped and where Houston was camped. So Houston may have been aware of it. Some of his men may have seen it in this one skirmish. So that that is is a, a living thing that was still that was there when he was there. Um, now the other thing, so that's three sites that you might want to pay attention to. The other thing, and again, looking at it from things that you might be interested in, you know, Houston was very secretive. He didn't. Uh, he didn't really have an ally in his army. He didn't have anybody that he trusted. He didn't tell anybody what his strategy was. He was retreating across the state of Texas, across the country, the Texas countryside, and trying to outfox the Mexican army. And what he was really doing, he was using, I think, Napoleon's strategy. And Napoleon used maneuverability as as a, a, a tactic. And Houston was very maneuverable because he didn't have any big baggage train. He didn't, he lived off the land. His men, the only thing they could eat would be the, the cattle that they could kill along the way or whatever they could get from uh, the farmers or ranchers along the way. Uh, whereas Santa Ana had a big baggage train and, and supplies and they had to worry about that. So Houston was using, uh, really the tactics of Napoleon. And he was also um, doing something that Napoleon did very well, which is avoid small battles. There were a couple of cases. Houston's men wanted to fight all the time. They were really unhappy. They thought that Houston was a coward. They thought he was uh, he was scared to fight the Mexicans. There were a couple of battles where, where they actually, you know, certainly could have won. But they, Houston said, no, we're going we're gonna to retreat. We're going to keep retreating, keep retreating. And the strategy there was to hold out for one large, totally decisive battle. And that's, of course, what San Jacinto was. And that was always Napoleon's strategy as well. One battle of complete annihilation. So anyway, all along that whole path, uh, it was almost, and maybe I'm, I'm getting a little, uh, a little metaphorical here, but it was almost as if Napoleon was whispering in his ear, giving him advice. I think Napoleon was his only real close advisor, at least until Thomas Russ came along. Uh, and uh, he was so, if you if you're out there and you happen to hear someone speaking French, uh, you might you might just consider whether or not Napoleon had anything to do with Sam Houston. <laughs> so anyway, uh, are there any questions? I well before uh, the, they have some questions for you, I've got a comment. We have uh, years ago we went to Vince's Bridge. Oh, and good. actually, yeah, Gerald, uh, who is on uh, the podcast tonight, took a picture. And he had to take a picture of me uh, down uh, close to where the roadway was there, and there was a handrail, and there was a huge echo mist that formed around me there. So we got a, a, you know, that was very supernatural. Now, we were very cautious in that we are a limit to who can smoke cigarettes, and we had some smokers in the group at the time. But uh, on a ghost hunt, we have areas that are away from where we're shooting pictures and stuff. There's no way this will smoke. I can guarantee you. Huh. You know, and so uh, we ruled out all the things there. And the only thing we can come up with is it's a real ecto mist. And, and I, I might forward you a copy of that picture just for oh, that'd your be interesting. Yeah, because yeah. you were at the same place I was. Yeah. You know, but the missing bridge was critical in catching Santa Ana. Because it was, Santa, was he couldn't get back across. Yeah, he, he couldn't get across, and he it, he didn't know how to swim. He was actually afraid of the water, which is uncommon for a soldier. Uh, he didn't know how to swim, so he couldn't swim across the bayou, and uh, they caught him nearby, uh, nearby Vince's Bridge. Okay, very good. Uh, and uh, 
So I, I did want to make you aware that we did, and we have visited that particular site. And That's that good. Well, I picked one. I, I thought that would be a good yeah, one. Yes. Yeah, it is a good one. And I would encourage other paranormal investigators to investigate that site. And we're certainly going to check out the, the sites you've recommended to us. Uh, I don't know, Bubba, Gerald, uh, Danny, anybody have a question? Uh-oh. Who did we lose? We lost Bubba. <laughs> wow. No, uh, John, I, I don't have any questions. He's he's pretty much explained it. And thank you for that. Um, I'm ready to go. Let's go hunt those places, man. Okay. Well, I'm ready to do it, too. Uh, and I would like, you know, I thought this was an excellent opportunity. I was so glad that I went and got, saw his presentation at San Center Battleground and that, uh, I, you know, I got a copy of his book and that he autographed it for me. And then in sitting down and reading it, I was thinking, you know, that the, the anniversary date's coming up. And then a lot of residual type hauntings, it, things happen on anniversary dates. So, you know, it's a good time of the year. We have are trying to come out of COVID. And it's a good opportunity for us right. to get together and start trying to go to some of these sites and get busy again and, and to take some uh, photographs and uh, to, to visit these sites. And we're also at the same time trying to make this documentary about the Battle of San Jacinto. So the road to San Jacinto is part of that story. I mean, the, like Dave says, it was 19 minutes. This other was more time. So if you're telling 42, the story. 42 days. And, yeah, if and you're telling, where Houston had to make all his decisions. Yeah. So if we're telling the story, it's natural that we would want to include that. So, uh, Dave, if you don't mind, we probably are going to call on you uh, in our investigation from time sure. to time and check with you and, and see if there's any other uh uh, insights you can give us to some of these areas. And actually, if you think you would like to come with us, we'd be more than happy to have you come. Well, it you know, depends on when you do it and all that. I'm I'm busy. I'm on my next project already. I'm uh, okay. I'm I'm doing another history project right now. Trying to we're trying to create uh, something else. Uh, so I'm pretty tied up with that one. But maybe you know maybe what the heck. Okay, well, it may be that you have a weekend. I mean, normally we only take a few hours, you know, at some yeah. of these places. It's not like we spend a week there or anything. No. Uh, and, uh, you know, it might be fun to have you along and, and have you uh, tell us stories that maybe we haven't reached because you'll remember sure. some of these journals and stuff of, of oh, some yeah. of these people. And by uh, the way, the, they're, they're all listed in the bibliography of a book. And okay. one of the best sources... There's one website, and you'll see it referenced again and again in there. It's called Portal to Texas History, okay. and it's managed by University of North Texas. Okay. And they have a lot of original maps, a lot of original documents, journals, uh, things that, uh, you know, you don't want to have to go to the library to find. They've digitized them all, and they make them available free of charge for people to research Texas history. Okay. Very good. Does anybody else have any questions for Dave? Uh, hi, Dave. This is Bubba Haley. Okay. Hey, uh, well, uh, it was a great history lesson, and uh, it brought to my mind that I did not pay attention in high school or college to history, and I don't know how I graduated, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I don't... I, 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 I must have been a C student or a D student in history. I just, I, I that, that was great. I, I loved, I love history. I love knowing about it. And you, you go a little deeper than I guess most history classes would. You know, they kind of give you the overview, and I really like that. And uh, John and I are putting together, um, and the reason we really started the podcast is to get up uh, some listenership and viewership for our upcoming docu series which we're going to shoot for television. And we already have uh, some networks, including Roku and Hulu and Strike cool. TV and all of these that uh, are going to put us on. And we're compiling all this information and shooting the video. And then we'll go into the edit suite and we'll edit that down. And we hope to do that in the first uh, sec first or second quarter of this year and, and to this where we put together on, our uh, TV shows. Strictly on Sam Houston? Strictly on the, on the Texas Revolution? Yes. 
Texas history mostly. Well, yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this cool. particular one, yes. And we, we, uh, we, we've already done some video uh, at the San Jacinto Monument. Uh, we have other plans to do the Alamo and Goliad and all that. So really the series won't be just a season one, episode one. Yeah. It would probably be more like a season one, episode one, two, three, four, five. And then we may jump into something else. Okay. You know, of course, cool. we, we probably would because it's not going to we're going to try to continue this on. But yes, I'd love to have you on there and. You know, you you could uh, you know do some cameos, and you could be kind of the his, historical buff on on, on this, yeah. and kind of guide us along. And you have a great voice, you have a good voice, and I'm sure that you, you could uh, narrate a lot of this and read some of your book, and also promote your book. So I'd love yeah. to have you on the TV show. Oh, I'm a, I'm a ham. I, give me an audience. I'm a happy kid. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you you you're right though. What you say about not enjoying history when you're in school cool because they give you this big thick secondary book that lists all the dates and the places and names of famous people and it's easy for the teacher to grade you you know you can say yes or no on, on a question and, and whether you got the right date or the right names but that doesn't generate any interest the interest comes from actually going to a spot and knowing what happened right here at this spot 200 years ago, 170 years ago, on a certain date. That's that's what's fun. We certainly agree with you on that. Yeah, uh, most, I, most I of agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and really, in, in high school especially, uh, when, you know, you had to take history, uh, I might have took, a, as a freshman, a history course, and then I said, no, I'm, I'm an idiot, so I'm not going to do that anymore. So, but you had to really, in high school, learn dates. You know, you were into memory. You know, you had to memorize, because they're going to question you, you know, when was this date, and who was there, and who was the general? So, they're asking you specific questions, so it wasn't fun. It was it a memory wasn't fun, challenge. And it was easy and, for me you know, to know about the dates. Yeah, it wasn't. I, I had a similar yeah, experience. Very easy to grade you. <laughs> I, I, I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I never, I thought Fort Wayne was the worst city in the world and that nothing had ever happened there. And there was this low spot on the river about half a mile from my home where we used to play as kids, you know, and throw rocks at beer bottles and toss each other in the river if we could, and, you know, do all the stuff that 10 year old kids do. And I never, knew that there was anything that had ever happened there. But it turns out, after I left town, after I went away and moved to somewhere else, <clears throat> I read a little history, and that exact spot in 1740 was very important for the French fur trade. And that was where the, the Indians and the Frenchmen cooperated, and the Indians collected a toll when, when the French fur traders would pass through there and the Indians became rich and the uh, French fur trade went on through there down the Ohio River, down to the Mississippi and across uh, the ocean to, uh, to France. But it all went through that one little area in Fort Wayne where, uh, where I, you know, I thought nothing had ever happened. And if I'd known about that in high school, I'd probably still be living there because I think it was the coolest <laughs> place in the world. <laughs> well, as you know, too, Dave, I, I'm sure you know that to, uh, Houston is uh, predicted that in the, the, the coming years is going to be the largest city in the United States. Yep. And, so, and that means that a lot of people from California are moving here to New York, some of these other places. And one of the concerns I have is that as they come here, they're not going to vote right because they're in some of these other states that don't vote the way I I think. And I think that part of it is our, our historical nature and stuff and what we have believed in all of our lives. And as these people move to this area, I think it's important that they learn our Texas history. Yes. That they learn about these events, that they know uh, more about the area and become attached to the Texas that we know. Mm -hmm. and become real Texans because, you know, uh, let's face it, Houston is not the prettiest place in the world, you know, well, physically. parts of it are nice. 
Yeah, there are nice parts to it. I'm not saying it's not. And it always has a, that home feel to me, yeah. you know. But when somebody wants to, to take a picture of some of these waterfalls and some of these mountains and stuff that are gorgeous and are absolutely the works of God, when you got flat terrain out there, it's hard to say. <laughs> you know, well, this is where, this is home to me, you know. <laughs> Yeah, what I yeah, like the only about thing Houston, I take a picture. <laughs> Houston is yeah. a little chaotic, and that's well, that's a sign yeah. of freedom to me. <laughs> that freedom is chaotic. If we were uh, if we were all one big planned community, every home would look the same and be exactly so many feet from the next home. And that's not Houston. We've got a yeah. lot of individuals here. Yeah. And actually, we've had a, a bunch of people that were historically very fond of the city and very good to the city. You take Jesse H. Jones sure. and some and some of the other people that are involved uh, throughout Houston's history, and you look at them, they had a great care for the city itself and the people, and the, the, they made Houston develop, and they had the foresight. Some of the fathers, uh, that when I was in high school and stuff, that were the leaders of our land, they got Lake Houston, they got Lake Conroe, they got Lake Livingston, and all this water is becoming very short on supply. Yep. And their foresight has provided us mm -hmm. with things that we need. And so I think that people need to understand that these forward-thinking people are part of our history mm -hmm. and that it needs to be uh, continued on our part. And that's how we vote. That's why our place is such, that's why people are coming here for jobs right now because our economy is a little better than most places in the country oh, yeah. right now. Yep. And even the, right now, I'm seeing some economy that's not doing quite so well because I'm seeing places closed now and I'm starting to get concerned. And it may be more important than ever that we do this Texas documentary. Oh, well, that, that's why I came here originally. I came here out of graduate school at University of Michigan. And if I'd stayed up there, I'd, I'd still be working in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with working at a bar either, you know, but well, hey. Yeah, I, I, I'd be, uh, I, I wouldn't be as happy as I am. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't be as happy as I am either, and, and I do appreciate your book, and I think it was uh, it was meant for me to see it, and I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad we met, and uh, I appreciate your book and your effort, and, and I know it was a great deal of effort on your part, and I I certainly appreciate it. It was all fun. It was every every bit of it was fun. Well, it, investigating it on our part is going to be fun too. Every and, and I thank <laughs> Texas A and M for publishing it. Yes, sir. Absolutely. They, uh, they liked it, and that was it. Yeah. Well, does anybody else have any questions or, or want to say anything before we uh, let Dave go? Dave, you Thank have any you final comments? Dave. All right. Well, call me anytime. Let me know if you, if you want me to visit with one of your uh, trips. I'll, if I'm available, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll email you, let you, get, you know, kind of what our schedule is going to be. We're working on okay. the schedule now when we're going to go different places. So once we get that worked out, I'll email you if you're available sometime or if you become available and you see you're available and you know we're going that, hey, give us a shout, let us know. All righty. Thanks a bunch. I appreciated it. Uh, we do too. But before you go, we're going to have uh, Jarrell go ahead and close us out with a prayer. Thank you, John. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this time that we've had together for this podcast, Lord. God, I ask that you bless and touch everyone this week, Lord, and just let them know that you are there for them, Lord, as always. And Lord, may everyone have a blessed week. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Good night, Bye -bye. everybody. Thank you much. Thank you. Uh-huh.